The Insidious Dr. Fu Manchu by Sax Romer. First of all, just kind of a brief explanation of where I am. I'm in the shower. We've got a new baby now and we've got a small apartment. So uh, if I want to continue doing this little hobby, I've had to kind of lock myself in the shower to do it. Uh, I think the sound is alright. It's a little echoey in here, but I think it'll come through on the camera fine. If it doesn't, just let me know and I'll reevaluate. Anyways, The Insidious Dr. Fu Manchu by Sax Romer. Now, uh, this is a bit of an interesting one. And uh, I guess this being the internet, uh, you never know who's going to be watching this. Uh, possibly, you, uh, if you're a bit of a geek, maybe you already know all about Dr. Fu Manchu. If you're a bit of a normal person, maybe you've never heard of him before. So I'll just kind of give a rundown here. I first heard of Dr. Fu Manchu at a college course I was taking. The course was called Western Perceptions of China. Uh, and it was all about how China was portrayed in Western media. It, it was a fascinating course, actually. So we kind of started all the way back, I think, from like Marco Polo or, Polo or something like that. And we just kind of read all these various uh, depictions of China. Marco Polo actually is historical, but most of them were fictional, just kind of fictional portrayals of China as China was portrayed in kind of Western novels. And then kind of as, if we, as we worked up in time, eventually got to more modern media, but it was primarily model, it was primarily novels. Um, and it was always, I think, a general trend was either kind of, it would be kind of a very simplistic or patronizing view of the Chinese people, something like The Good Earth by, what was her name, Pearl Buck, or it would be kind of portraying China as just like a backdrop for Westerners to have adventures. Uh, something like The Fate of Man by Andre Mauro. Um, yeah, there were very few kind of just outright racists view of China, except for Fu Manchu. This was like the one just blatantly racist portrayal of China. Um, and the professor showed us some experts from a novel, and then we looked at some Fu Manchu comics. He, he had his own like comic strip in the 1930s. And then we saw some clips from the movie. Uh, and it was just like blatantly racist. Uh, the premise behind it, if you're not familiar, is Fu Manchu is an evil Chinese doctor who wants to take over the world. And he's constantly being thwarted by these British detectives. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, the, the stated explicitly throughout kind of the novels and the comic books and everything. Uh, he doesn't, he's not just an evil doctor who happens to be Chinese. Uh, it's very explicitly stated that he's evil because he's Chinese. So this idea that the, the Chinese just kind of want to take over the world. Uh, and then the film clip we watched, which this was a number of years ago, so I forget exactly the movie, but I think it was The Mask of Dr. Fu Manchu. Had kind of Fu Manchu and I think his daughter doing all these things, and they were kind of assisted by a bunch of kind of black henchmen. So, you know, the professor said to us, you can see here the the idea is that the, it's kind of the Chinese are the leaders, but kind of all the brown races are in this conspiracy against the white people. Just, yeah, you know, you don't get much more classic racist than that. So uh, it was very much an instructive situation in kind of how Chinese people have been per, kind of portrayed negatively in the past and sinister and kind of all this stuff. Um, yeah, so it was instructive from that angle. And also, I've got to confess though, I've always been a geek, and I've always been kind of fascinated by, you know, these old uh, pulp fiction or kind of serial stuff. Like, you know, I used to like the old 
Lone Ranger stuff or the old Green Hornet radio show or Flash Gordon or stuff like that. And, you know, a lot of this stuff was harder to track down when I was young, you know, and, the, and the, nowadays it's all, all, all over the internet. But to the extent I could get my hands on this, I was always fascinated. Uh, Dick Tracy uh, was, uh, Dick Tracy had a revival in the 90s with that movie and then for a while it was, you could like buy the copies of the old radio show or the old movies. I was fascinated by that. So, yeah, I guess my interest in Fu Manchu uh, is kind of coming at this from two angles. One is kind of a study in racism. I think it's interesting uh, for people who are interested in kind of anti-racism as an example of kind of what things have been like in the past and kind of what, what we have to be careful of or what we have to be mindful of when we think about the experience of Chinese Americans. Uh, even though I think the guy who wrote it was actually British. The guy, the guy who wrote the series was British, but I think uh, a lot of the movie productions were um, American. But also just, you know, as somebody who is interested in the history of kind of pop culture and all these kind of old adventure series. I mean, Fu Manchu back in his day was huge. There was like a series of like 20 novels or something. There was a comic strip. There was a comic book. He, he ran in comic books for a while. Uh, he had his own radio show, he had several movies, uh, some of them I think were like the normal two-hour movies and some of them were like those movie serials, you know, where it was 15 minutes every week that you kind of tuned in for. Uh, he had his own TV show at one point, um, and uh, you know, nowadays he's just completely forgotten. And I think some of that is just kind of the natural way, you know, like a lot of these kind of old pulp things from the 1930s and 40s just get forgotten naturally. But also he's incredibly politically incorrect, so that's, that's another reason why nobody's reviving the franchise nowadays. Uh, you know, like, uh, like John Carter of Mars, right? He had been completely forgotten and then Disney decided to revive the franchise. I, I don't think that's going to happen with Dr. Fu Manchu. Um, so, in, yeah, all of that is to say, I guess I had kind of a dual interest in tracking these books down. Um, on the one hand, I kind of viewed it as, as a progressive thing to do, to kind of go back and re-examine some of these old books that have been highly racist. I... Why is that progressive? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. It was something that my university professors had encouraged us to engage with, to kind of uh, think about what, what had been in this media in the past and kind of the experience of colored people in America. So from that perspective, I think it was progressive to kind of remember this stuff. Although, I don't know, arguably, maybe the best thing to do with this stuff is just forget about it. Just don't even, you know, don't talk about it, don't watch it, uh, I don't know. You know, maybe by kind of seeking these books out and reading them, even if you think you're doing it from a progressive standpoint, you're perpetuating it. Especially in my case, because now I'm doing a review of it, bringing it to the attention of more people who otherwise might not have heard about it. Uh, I don't know. I, 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 I guess point being, I kind of viewed it as a progressive thing to do to kind of look at this stuff, this racist stuff from the past and critique it. On the other hand, I was also just fascinated by the pulp fiction aspect of it, the old adventure serials, 1930s adventure aspect of it. So I guess I was trying to have my cake and eat it too. I was trying to kind of critique it as kind of a dated piece of racist media, but I was also fascinated by the cultural history of it. Um, so, th there's a famous quote in the book which kind of very nicely, well not nicely, very accurately kind of sums up the tone of it. This is uh, one of the characters describing Dr. Fu Manchu to another character, and he says, imagine a person Tall, lean, and feline, high-shouldered, with a brow like Shakespeare, 
and a face like Satan, a close-shaven skull and long magnetic eyes of the true green cat. Invest him with all the cruel cunning of the entire Eastern race, accumulated in one giant intellectual, with all the resources, if you will, of a wealthy government, which, however, has denied all knowledge of his existence. Imagine that awful being, and you have a mental picture of Dr. Fu Manchu, the yellow peril incarnate in one man. Um, now, the novels here. Uh, Dr. Fu Manchu, the, all the novels are named after him. The first one is called The Insidious Dr. Fu Manchu. Actually, sorry, that, I'm using the American version. Uh, it was written by a British author, and I think in, originally in Britain it was released as The Mysterious Dr. Fu Manchu. Or the mystery, maybe, of Dr. Fu Manchu. I don't remember. The Insidious Dr. Fu Manchu is the American version of the novel. Uh, the American title. But yeah, Fu Manchu is not actually the main character. Uh, the, the hero of the series is a British government agent named Nayland Smith. Uh, and the series is narrated by, from the point of view of Smith's trusted friend and confidant, confidant Dr. Petrie. Uh, the manner is very reminiscent of the relationship between Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Uh, and in fact, Sax Romer, the guy who wrote this book, was very actively copying the Sherlock Holmes books. So Dr. Petrie is like Dr. Watson. He's the narrator of the book, uh, and he kind of accompanies Nayland Smith on the adventures. Nayland Smith is like Sherlock Holmes. It, it's like Sherlock Holmes if Sherlock Holmes was investigating the, investigating the same villain in every book. Uh, that's, I guess, kind of the tenor of the Fu Manchu series. Um, Fu Manchu represents the yellow peril incarnate, who, with the help of his oriental henchmen, plot the doom of the white race. To say this book is politically incorrect is an understatement. In fact, even simply calling it racist wouldn't be doing it justice. Every page contains something blatantly offensive. Examples are simply too numerous to mention, but they include Naylin Smith's assertions about the cruelty of the Chinese race, or the comments about the ease with which Oriental women form attachment to men, or simply the assumption throughout the book that there is a constant race war and that the lower races are always looking for ways to plot the doom of the white race. Um, what makes the book readable from a modern standpoint is that all of this is so over the top that it becomes self-parody. It's like Mystery Science Theater 3000. You can't help but laugh at our unenlightened ancestors as you read the book. That's a little bit unfair. It's, it's assuming everyone in that era was unenlightened just because these books are. But, but you can't help but laugh at these books. And, you know, these books were popular back in their day. So, you know, the, at least, yeah, at least some of our ancestors bought into that. The only thing that sobers me a little bit about it is wondering what impact these books had when they came out in 1913. Uh, you know, did people who read these books back in 1913 get the impression that all Chinese people were plotting the destruction of Western civilization? Uh, and if they did, would this have led to any kind of violence or bullying against Asian immigrants in England or America? Because that wouldn't be funny, right? That, that would be kind of you know, blatant violence as a result of these books. I've, I'm just speculating here. I don't know of any documented cases where somebody, you know, a Chinese person was beat up because somebody had read a Dr. Fu Manchu book. But, you know, people do stupid stuff. It's, it's possible. 
So, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, maybe people back in those days weren't as dumb as we think they were. You know, like, I read this book, but I think to myself, well, you know, I'm a sophisticated 21st century person. I can handle this. Uh, I know the difference between like a stupid book and reality. But uh, maybe I'm not giving our ancestors enough credit. Maybe they did as well. Uh, the Fu Manchu series, kind of getting to the cultural impact here, is called kind of the literary link between Sherlock Holmes and James Bond. So it, uh, it was heavily influenced by Sherlock Holmes. It was roughly contemporary with Sherlock Holmes, at least when it started. Came out in 1913. I think uh, Sherlock Holmes stories were still being written up through the 1920s. So yeah, roughly contemporary. Um, it was an inspiration for a lot of other characters. Ming the Merciless from the Flash Gordon series was apparently based off of Fu Manchu. Uh, the character of the Mandarin from the Iron Man comics when he first appeared in the 1960s was apparently based after Fu Manchu. Uh, and then Ian Fleming, the guy who wrote the James Bond books, was apparently influenced by Fu Manchu. Um, and you can see this if you kind of read through the book. It's got elements of Sherlock Holmes, where Neyland Smith is trying to kind of solve the, the, the mystery and kind of figure out what Fu Manchu is up to. But it also has a lot of elements of James Bond. Uh, you know, it's got a lot of kind of secret layers, cunning supervillain, trap doors, uh, all this kind of stuff. Um, it reads... The, you know, the book is from 1913, so over a hundred years old now, and it reads kind of in a stilted prose that you'd associate kind of with a Victorian era book. I mean, it's not Victorian, it would, it, Victorian was, Victoria, I think, died in 1900. So Edwardian at this point, an Edwardian book, but you know, it's an old book, so it's a little bit stiff and kind of coming with a modern reader it requires a little patience. But if you have the patience, it's readable. Uh, the entire book is a battle of wits between Dr. Nalin Smith and Dr. Fu Manchu. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, they're always kind of on the verge of getting each other. Like Dr. Nalin Smith will be just about to capture Dr. Fu Manchu and then Dr. Fu Manchu will slip through his fingers. Or Nalin Smith and Dr. Petrie will be walking around and then they'll stumble into one of Dr. Fu Manchu's diabolical death traps. And then Dr. Fu Manchu will be just about to catch them in their death trap and then they'll find some way out of it at the last minute. So the whole book is kind of cat and mouse between Nalin Smith and Dr. Petrie and Fu Manchu with uh, the detectives almost being able to capture Fu Manchu or Fu Manchu almost capturing them in one of his death traps. It's easy to see how this became the inspiration for James Bond. On the other hand, halfway through the book, I just kind of lost my patience with it. I don't know, maybe as a modern reader, I don't have the patience that people had 100 years ago. Maybe television has ruined my attention span. But I just, wanted, I just wanted to get to the final showdown, showdown with Dr. Fu Manchu. I just got sick of all these near misses. Um, but then when I finally dig into the climatic final face off with Fu Manchu at the ending, uh, it paid off. The, you know, the ending climax was really great. Um, so they, they capture Fu Manchu at the end of this book, but this is the this is the first in a long series of books. Uh, it's, it's, it's a long running series, just like Sherlock Holmes was. I have not yet continued on with the next books in the series. I don't know, maybe I will someday. Maybe, maybe the curiosity will get the better of me. Uh, but I felt like after having read to the end of the first one, I felt like, yeah, okay, I got the general idea of this. I got the tone. I don't know if I have the patience to read all the rest of the books. 
but it's a whole long series uh, if anyone is interested in continuing on with that. Okay, I'm going to finish here.